Fidico and the African Dream. Fidico. Finance, Innovation, Development and Investment. Finance. Fidico has created financial engineering concepts and the mechanisms which we have successfully used for large-scale development projects in several African countries at no cost to their governments and without the need for loans. Innovation. FIDICO is refining from experience the new ecological or natural science paradigm as essential to sustainable development. FIDICO is the pioneer of innovative development in Africa. Development. FIDICO has invented new technologies in every field as appropriate to development and has the support of international civil society organizations, scientists, inventors and innovators. Investment. FIDICO develops economic opportunities for all Africans. Opportunities exist for investment, joint ventures and project participation of every kind. The African Dream is the creation of Mohamed Kamal Hassan of Egypt. Evolution of the African Dream The story of the African Dream is the story of Mohamed Kamal, Abdel Hadi Hassan, and a mission which has driven him through 25 years of adversity to solve the problems of Egypt. At the young age of 17, as the pole vault champion and a professional handball player, Mohamed became the top athlete in Egypt. As a professional sportsman, he saved money and started a printing business, soon to become the largest and most modern in Egypt. By the age of 25, he had become Egypt's youngest self-made multimillionaire, with an empire valued at 300 million US dollars. Mohammed was then asked by Ibrahim Azad, the religious leader at the time, to use his talents and energy to help solve the worsening problems of the youth in Egypt. So a year later, he bought 8,000 hectares in the Western Desert and employing 5,000 of the youth, built a new agricultural community. They learned important skills in the construction and management of the project, which would be important as Mohammed's plan was that they would eventually become the owners and operators of Al Amal. This was a unique concept for an Egyptian businessman at that time and the project was considered a technological miracle by the press and as interviewed on Egyptian television. With the success of Al Amal city and expensive canals and infrastructure in place, Mohammed decided to continue with his community development in the Western Desert. He formed a delegation to tour countries where Egyptians had settled to introduce his concept and to encourage their participation. Starting in Australia, his mission was a tremendous success, with many Egyptians there enthusiastically promising financial support and some even thinking of returning to Egypt. The next stop of the tour was the United States, where he met with the same success in each city they visited. In Washington DC, even the US President Jimmy Carter met Mohammed with a delegation of government and private. Support was discussed in several areas and a joint venture animal husbandry project was signed with the US Department of Agriculture, the largest such contract they had so far entered into with a foreign private businessman. However, having gone to bed on 19 October 1987, riding high on the euphoria of success he awoke the next morning penniless and owing $50,000 on his cancelled credit card. The Egyptian government had confiscated all his assets and bank accounts. This was the day of the US stock market crash. It turned out that many Egyptian companies had made a business of accepting funds from Egyptians working in the Arab countries and investing in the US stock market. This had worked very well for years until the crash when everyone had lost their money. The reaction of the Egyptian government was to pass a law to close all such companies. There were 35 of these companies, but corrupt Egyptian officials illegally 
it was recently determined by the Egyptian Supreme Court and opportunistically included Mohammed's El Helal group. This decision could not have been more inappropriate as none of Mohammed's few shareholders, most had been given shares as bonuses, had lost any money and he had not invested any money overseas or in any stock market. To the contrary, all of Mohammed's actions were to the exceptional benefit of Egypt. No one had reason to complain about the actions of unquestionably the most uncorrupt businessman in Egypt. Mohammed had previously been warned that his success and popularity was of concern to the Egyptian government. But Mohammed was young and inexperienced in the ways of the world, politics, corruption and international agendas. Now in illegally enforced exile from Egypt, his experience commenced. Following many harrowing experiences, trying to earn a living in Central Africa, some of them life-threatening, Mohammed was introduced to a uniquely successful new technology innovator in South Africa. Cecil Davis, an American, had been stationed at the US Missile and Satellite Tracking Station in Pretoria when the US State Department decided to close it for political reasons. Prior to this announcement, Cecil had been asked by the South African Weather Bureau to design a system for tracking, receiving and recording pictures from the US weather satellites as they passed over Africa. So he quickly registered a company, South African Technical Industries, with half US personnel from the Pretoria tracking station and half talented South African engineers interested to pursue their inventive. The weather satellite system was considered a great success as Cecil with the Minister of Transport and the Director of the Weather Bureau viewed the first satellite pictures to be received in Africa. As the system could track and receive both normal photographs and infrared nighttime pictures, it had to operate on a 24-hour basis. This was difficult for the Weather Bureau, so SATI then designed its own computer making the system automatic tracking without any human in attendance. The ISIS computer was very successful as was the ability to design and build automation systems to specific local requirements. After many such systems, each with innovative features, SATI began receiving overseas attention, resulting in the export of the ISIS computer and automation systems to countries such as Germany, South Korea, Canada and the US Navy. This caused a sensation in South Africa in 1972. Cecil then formed with Dr. John Gauss the company Bionix, when requested by Professor Christian Barnard, the world's first heart transplant surgeon, to design and build special equipment for improvement of heart transplants. Two world patents were received for the world's first portable defibrillator and for an instrument for stopping the heart without shocking it for open heart surgery. After many more such successful ventures, Cecil was approached by a Rhodes civil engineer, who in 1952 had developed and patented what he maintained was a new type of compactor that would revolutionize the construction of roads, airports, earth dams, major construction sites, etc. He had shown this to everyone in the industry for 20 years the Department of Transport, the CSIR, consulting engineers and contractors, all thought him delusional at best. But the logic behind the concept appealed to Cecil, who after all had so far never failed to develop the technology of anyone who asked him to do so. So in 1974, Cecil formed a company with Berange. After 10 years and many design changes, they had compacted hundreds of roads, hiring the equipment or subcontracting to contractors and they had developed a product range of high energy impact compactors and a new technology. The technology was so successful that threats were received from international construction equipment manufacturers should the impact compactor be offered for sale on the world market.
All the inventors and innovators of South Africa with new technology were still coming to Cecil for assistance. As with each and every project undertaken, the technological objective was successfully achieved. But it had become obvious that the successful development of a new technology would always be blocked by vested interests, limiting the satisfaction for the inventor. So this basic and persistent problem had to be overcome. In 1985, Cecil brought all these creative people together into an informal group, which he called the Community Development Network, CDN. Working together with common goals and objectives, the combination of all their developments and their individual knowledge resulted in a unique resource capable of looking at national problems outside the scope of either government or local industry. For example, Dr. Bronte, a founding member of the United Nations and now a founding member of CDN, had been requested to solve the problem of pollution caused by the waste from mines and refineries. Working with Davis and his impact compactor, she used refinery and plastic waste, etc., to produce a waterproof and long lasting road surface. The perpetual problem with rural roads, especially in the informal townships, which were washed away each year by the heavy rains. The CDN group has been called upon by international consultants to solve problems in several countries, such as water purification problem on Malta and for compacting and stabilizing the sands being dredged from the sea to construct a new airport at Hong Kong. Working as a network led to the ability to design complete communities, consult, subcontract and carry out projects, thus further developing and using their own technologies on their own projects to the benefit of everyone. The concept of a unique system for innovation evolved to combat vested interests and the blockages to innovative development. But their problems persisted. Locally, large organizations such as the foreign-owned mines were not interested to invest the funds necessary to solve their pollution problems and no bank or financial institution was interested. The solution. Cecil's meeting with Mohammed Hassan turned out to be of historical importance. Mohammed and the CDN scientists had a common philosophy and had followed a parallel path with their successes having been blocked by vested interests. Most unusual for a successful businessman, Mohammed was a true humanitarian, as were those of the Community Development Network. But unlike humanitarian scientists or inventors, who use all their funds on their project, their obsession, Mohammed was accustomed to making money. Mohammed had formed a development company, Pidico, as the intended investment vehicle for overseas Egyptian investors, interested to support the continuation of his community development initiative in Egypt. So Pidico South Africa was formed. Pidico was then invited to Mozambique as a delegation, including the scientists and innovators. They were received with enthusiasm and all the country's needs were presented. But Mozambique, still at war, had no money. So as Pidico was preparing specific project proposals for the development of the priorities described by the government, Mohammed developed a unique, specialized and unconventional debt swap arrangement specifically for such development. This was agreed to by Mozambique, allowing Mohammed to realize 64 million US dollars in local currency and the development of Mozambique commenced. An immediate priority was the recovery of a $260 million textile factory in Mokuba, which had been initiated by the East Germans before the start of the Civil War, but not finished when they had to flee the area. It was a factory of 12 hectare under one roof, except that the roof had not been started, leaving everything including crates of equipment exposed to 16 years of torrential seasonal rains, theft and vandalism. Mohammed was able to make some compromise arrangement with the rebels which made it possible to commence work in relative safety. A year and a half later, President Chisano 
and a senior delegation from Maputo were able to visit and tour the projects. Starting with a tour of the factory, the president and his delegation were surprised and amazed at every turn in the massive, now very busy complex. He was impressed and surprised to see the large fleet of tractors in perfect condition and all required plows, disc harrows, planters, etc. Also, he didn't expect to see a new hospital complete with all equipment, even for emergency surgery and a modern, fully equipped ambulance. President Chisano also took great delight in laying the corner block at the entrance of a new community housing project just started by Pitico. The tour finished with a visit to the 10,000 hectare farm where Pitico was growing cotton for the factory and the cotton gin, where the first cotton harvest was being prepared for the factory and to fill a major export order. Later that evening, Pitico treated the delegation and everyone from the area to a feast and entertainment such as could not have been expected, especially in the middle of the war ravaged Mozambican bush. On parting, President Chisano penned an elaborate letter of accommodation to Pitico. Another joint venture with the Mozambican government is the bentonite mine south of Maputo, Pitico Bentonite of Mozambique. There was virtually no working equipment at the mine, so Pitico organized new and appropriate equipment for a proper mining operation. The caravan of equipment leaving Pretoria for the mine was an impressive sight. Within months, Pitico had mined and transported 120,000 tons of bentonite to stockpile at the nearby railway siding. Standing on this mountain of bentonite, Mohamed Hassan explains the operation to the Mozambique Minister of Minerals and Energy and his visiting counterpart. A sister company, Fidico, was then formed in response to a serious need for finance to assist government and local businessmen to acquire Mozambican national assets, which the World Bank, IMF, insisted to be privatized and to also assist local Mozambican entrepreneurs to own their own business. Pitico held an extremely successful competition with the inauguration of Fidico. Prizes were handed out by Marcelino dos Santos, the president of the ruling party, the Egyptian ambassador and the minister of trade and industry. Africa must be developed by Africans. And uh, we saw a lot of potentials in uh, Mozambique. It's a very rich country. It has a lot of uh, resources, minerals, raw materials, manpower, access to the sea, very nice environment, very kind people. And now all the rules and regulations is open to help foreigners to uh, join in the development of the country. Pitico then designed four free trade zones for Mozambique and one for Swaziland. The government of Namibia revealed to Mohamed a situation where the giant Rossing uranium mining operation at Arandus had closed down, leaving behind a complete town now empty. Pitico proposed a free trade zone for the town and designed one both for Arandus and Wolfers Bay. And we'll have the overall uh, rights and uh, the overall interest. Why Pitico? Uh, Pitico applied and they made a proposal to the government that they want to establish such a zone. There was no other applications, so cabinet approved Pitico's application, as I have said. As the Wolfish Bay site was being laid out, President Sam Nujoma performed an opening ceremony as part of the celebrations held when Wolfish Bay was turned over to Namibia by South Africa.
PDK's chairman, Mohammed Hassan, says the government has in principle awarded the free trade zone in Walfish Bay to his company. Hassan describes the project as the most attractive in Namibia's economy. The project will cost PDCO an estimated $200 million. It's a very, very important project for the economy. It will bring a lot of investment to the country, a lot of jobs to the country. It will improve the economy. At the request of the Namibian government, PDCO then funded a 280 million US dollar agricultural project, which was desperately needed by the Namibian government at the Caprivi Strip on its northern border. Two Antonov 124 aircraft delivered all the required tractors and agricultural equipment, a total of 220 tons. Mr. Hematenua, the Minister of Trade and Industry, was present when PIDICO Vice Chairman Cecil Davis to receive the giant aircraft at the closest airport. We basically organized an environment for innovation where we were able to use our scientists, our engineers, our inventors to be able to utilize their talents. It is going to revolutionize agriculture in this country, particularly in the northeastern part of the country, in the Caprivi Strip. The project and the investment of 280 million US dollars was widely heralded in the media and on television in Namibia. Pitico has invested more than 280 million dollars in the agricultural sector in Namibia. This being the biggest investment project since Namibia's independence could create more than 2,000 jobs when it gets into full swing. We have all the approvals and everything in writing. Uh, we have all the documents and once we get the approvals we decided to go ahead with a heavy, heavy investment and we send a lot of equipment. As a first phase, this project is long term, it's not a matter of one week or two. At this time Mohammed received approval in writing from the Egyptian Minister of Agriculture to continue with his recently submitted updated proposal for the continuation of his Al Amal agricultural community development in the Western Desert. And a permission in writing from the Minister of Economy to use his specially designed development oriented debt swap concept to finance it. However, on his return to Egypt, expecting to initiate the project, he discovered that this had been a trick of entrapment and he was jailed for seven years. He was only released when it was discovered that there were actually no charges against him and the Supreme Court judged that he had never actually committed any crime. His 23 years of adversity had been carried out by the previous government, permitting the Minister of Agriculture and the Attorney General to use his assets and his Al Amal City agricultural project for their personal financial benefit. It has been discovered that a company owned by them and illegally running the farm made 120 million pounds profit exporting potatoes from his farm in 2010 alone. They had been doing this for 23 years. From his Southern African experience and knowledge, it became obviously necessary to expand this mission to the accomplishment of a united and developed Africa. So while in near solitary confinement in Egypt, Mohammed was able to devote 20,000 uninterrupted hours, combining all his knowledge gained during his work in Egypt and Southern Africa and his creativity into a program as required to solve the problems of Africa, the African dream. Eventually on 8 June 2011, a final commercial court judgment, 25 years delayed, declared Mohammed innocent of any and all charges and ordered all his assets to be returned. The African Dream program is now presented in five mega volumes and reflects the knowledge gained by Mohammed while facing the real problems of Africa and the parallel experience of FIDICO scientists blocked by the opponents of innovation and to the development of Africa. The African Dream is based on the new natural science paradigm as necessary to create an independently viable united and developed Africa within 15 years.
The African Dream program has commenced January 2012.